So my uh, very short presentation, it will be to give you an introduction, is to what is the Research Data Alliance? What do we do? And more or less how it's governed, because uh, then Stephanie will talk to you about the uh, what the work is, the most important part, of course. So if I could go to the next slide, uh, as I mentioned when I introduced myself before, uh, the Research Data Alliance was um, set up in uh, 2013 after a number of years of discussions across uh, funding agencies and governments across the world with this rather grand and ambitious vision of researchers and innovators openly sharing and reusing data across technologies, across disciplines and across countries to address the grand challenges of society. So in a, in a nutshell, you know, anything, any technology at any time in any place in the world should be available for reuse, etc. And we're particularly talking about, of course, publicly funded research. Um, so uh, that rather ambitious but not unachievable vision um, is backed up, of course, by the mission. So how do we do that? We do that through building these social and technical bridges to enable that vision. Um, and for the Research Data Alliance, the social and the, uh, and the technical bridges are equally important. So we understand that we need many, many different uh, solutions to the da many data challenges across all disciplines and all areas of society. But uh, uh, much of that comes by connecting people, uh, building trust, building networks. And so RDA prides itself on having a rather large network of over 12,000 individual members from uh, 146 countries. So pretty global, I think we can say. Um, and we have, so individual membership is free. People come, they get involved. And we will talk a little bit about how you can practically do that uh, afterwards. The, um, if you like, coupled with the individual membership are we have a family of organizations who join us and support us financially as well um, to uh, also support the adoption and the uptake and the implementation of the solutions that are driven by this community. So our individual members are different, very many different stakeholders and experts from across the globe in focusing on, if you like, ma uh, many different areas, librarians to infrastructural managers, to IT people, to uh, you know, uh, funders, everything. Um, and the wonderful thing about RDA is, of course, its openness and its inclusivity. In fact, on the next slide, uh, one of the things when we set the Research Data Alliance up, a lot of thought and um, effort went into defining our guiding principles. And they are fundamental because they are the, if you like the basis on which every single thing in RDA is, is, uh, is if you like, done, but also uh, decisions are made around that. So we um, are very, it's very important openness that everything is consensus driven. We're very much a consensus organization, that it's inclusive, that there's harmonization across all different areas, particularly from a technical point of view, that everything is community driven. There are many top down uh, activities and we're complementary to them. RDA is a bottom up community driven organization and that it's not for profit and technology neutral. And what we mean by that is that all the outputs and all the activities that the Research Data Alliance community uh, takes on are done actually in a very open way and they are made available then for take up, reuse, customization, etc. Uh, onwards. But we don't encourage technology lock in at the point of uh, development during the working uh, group then. Stephanie will go on to talk about the, uh, the what we call, I like to call the heart of the Research Data Alliance. So the beating heart, of course, is the community and doing all those work, all that work through these different mechanisms that we have. But how is it governed, the Research Data Alliance? So on the next and last slide, I believe, um, we have a very, just a, a, to try and give you an understanding, I wouldn't call this a hierarchy or anything, but it's, or an organigram, it's more to try and give you the understanding that we have everything that we do, of course, is based around the heart of RDA, our community, be they individual, organization, or regional members. Um, and we have those three mechanisms there in the orange boxes. So communities of practice, working groups, and interest groups. And as I said, Stephanie will define the, uh, the, the give the definitions of those afterwards. Um, we have a couple of governance boards, very important, a technical advisory board. We need to provide social technical vision and strategy and to support the groups and the community while they define the activities and take them forward. 
We have an organizational advisory board, which as I talked about a little bit before, uh, from our, uh, which comes from our family of organizations who provide needs uh, around adoption and business advice and to support in the uptake and the organizational perspectives. And then also very important, RDA is by the community, for the community, it's global, but of course not one size fits all. And we need regional um, vision, we need regional strategy, we need very many different regional perspectives. So we have a regional advisory board with our regional partners. And across that, then we have a council who provide the overall vision and strategy. And I respond to the council. There are nine uh, person uh, elected board from across uh, the world and they provide uh, quite a significant amount of their time and um, all volunteer like all the other boards there as well uh, to support the research data alliance we do have a funders forum so the funders chose uh, not to be involved directly with the research data alliance in any of the governance boards but we have a funders forum with whom we interact quite uh, significantly and who support us very much. And all of that, if you like, is, uh, is uh, the daily operations of the Research Data Alliance are run by a secretariat. Currently, it can um, change very much in size. Uh, at the moment, we're quite a small group. Um, and then myself uh, as, a, as, if you like, a, a, the employee of the research of the foundation, which is the legal entity of the, of the RDA. So that's in a very quick and short burst uh, if you like the governance so quite simple quite uh, we don't it's not a very they're not none of the boards are big I think we have about 40 uh, governance members if we add all those boards together so as I said that's uh, really what is RDA how is it governed in a short to put set the context for the more important part that Stephanie will tell you now um, how we do the work thanks Stephanie okay thanks Hilary before we go to the next bits and I, shall, and I shall talk a bit about how the Research Data Alliance works and introduce you to working in interest groups and communities of practice. So as Hilary said, the heart of RDA are really the RDA groups that do the work. And by groups, we have three different types. We have working and interest groups, that's two different types. And we have a relatively recent addition, which are the communities of practice. So the general idea for all of them is really that they bring together a group of experts from different backgrounds, regions um, that come together to work on a specific topic. So this applies across all three group types and I'll go into more detail about each of them on the next slide. Each group is normally facilitated by a number of co-chairs, usually two to four, but we also have groups that have eight or nine, um, depending on what the group is doing, what kind of global coverage they achieve, um, that they may have more, um, but no group has fewer than two. Most groups work through regular virtual meetings or teleconferences or Zoom or whatever is being used these days. And quite a few of them also have active asynchronous channels. Some of them have Slack channels and things like that. And groups also meet quite regularly at our plenaries. So plenaries before COVID were face-to-face -face meetings where we had about uh, several hundred community members coming together at different locations around the world and groups presented their work there and advanced their work. So it, plenaries are somewhat different in that they are not conference, academic conferences where you present the, out, the outcomes from your research and get a couple of questions, but they, the sessions at our plenaries are really working meetings where the groups try to advance the work that they're doing in tackling their data challenges that they're addressing. Um, groups also often come together at the plenaries to, in joint sessions with um, other groups to explore synergies or to work on overlapping topics or to explore new areas that they could work on together. So again, the heart of RDA are these three group types. So working groups were actually the first type of group that we envisaged right in the beginning of RDA. They have a duration of 12 to 18 months. So working groups are finite, if you like. Um, and they develop and implement tools, policy, practices, products for data management that are adopted and used by others, by organizations, by communities, by other projects. The idea is that each working group 
creates um, at least one output, one recommendation in most cases. And these are concrete deliverables. They can be running code, they can be tools, they can be standard. I'll talk standards. I'll talk a little bit more about recommendations in detail, but at this point, it's important to know that these are actually things that are adoptable and adopted. So one of the ways we encourage this is that we ask working groups in particular to make sure that they have potential adopters involved in their work right from the start so that we don't have a working group that produces something and then goes around looking for adopters. It's more that the adopters drive and shape the development of the outputs to quite, a, quite an extent. That's quite an important principle. Interest groups look at um, solving specific data sharing problems and identifying what kind of infrastructure may need to be built, but they don't necessarily build it. Um, interest groups are, can be ongoing, so they can continue on um, while the interest group is active. And we do have a few groups that started in 2013 and are still going and going strong. Um, interest groups produce outputs that can be, for example, um, case statements for new working groups. So we have quite a few interest groups that start out with a broad discussion and then narrow it down to specific um, tasks they would like to tackle and then sort of spawn off new working groups that then address those uh, new topics. Um, other outputs they can create are guidelines, best practices, reports, quite a few have run surveys and presented um, the findings from those surveys in outputs that they produce. So there's quite a variety. Um, for those in Australia, you may have heard of the 23 research data things. That was an, um, an output from the Libraries for Research Data Interest Group a few years ago. And what was then ANS actually took that up and uh, ran a program within Australia about it. Communities of practice are our newest edition. Um, the idea there is while working in interest groups can be completely domain agnostic and can be focusing on um, on topics that are across multiple domains. Um, Communities of practice are meant to investigate, discuss, and provide knowledge and skills within a specific discipline or research domain. So the idea there is that um, they actually, um, they coordinate and have an awareness raising role in their discipline or research domain. They can be umbrella groups that may have interest in working groups sort of underneath them or as part of them, if you like. Um, communities of practice are ongoing. As I said, they are relatively new additions. So we currently have one that is being set up. So we don't have many, many long-term um, things that we can look at at this point. But the idea is that we'll, they will be ongoing, but will be reviewed every 18 months to see where they're going and how they're going and um, also whether they would like to continue. Outputs from communities of practice can be new working and interest groups. So as an umbrella group, they can um, again create more new groups. And the idea is also that they build bridges across RDA and externally with their domain or discipline. If you're looking to find what RDA groups we have. I'm actually not sure about the exact number. I should have looked at Hillary's slide. Um, I think we have around 100 groups at the moment still. Um, we have a page called RDA for You, which um, you can see the URL at the bottom right corner. That gives you a catalog um, that shows where you can select um, certain aspects of groups. So you can select the main focus, which can be data management, data collection, etc., or you can also select a domain or field of expertise or domain agnostic groups. And any group that has been tagged with any of those um, that you select will show up. You can also find a complete list of the current RDA working and interest groups um, on that page as well, where it says here, right behind the typo, where it should say interest groups. Um, that gives you all the groups that we currently have. Just um, one thing to explain, when you look at a group homepage, um, you will see a little icon towards the top of the group. That shows you where the group is at in its life cycle. For interest groups, that is relatively boring in a way. We have two statuses for interest groups. One is not yet endorsed, so the group is still working up its defining document and has not undergone an RDA review yet. Or the interest group 
<clears throat> excuse me, has been established, which means it has undergone the review and is now working. Um, working groups have slightly more statuses. They can also not yet be endorsed, so starting up um, before endorsement. And then we, about every six months, we expect the group to change slightly in what it does. So in the first six months after endorsement, working groups are normally getting started, finalizing their work plans that they have uh, proposed in their defining document, fine tuning things. Um, after about six to 12, from six to about 12 months, we expect them to produce their main deliverables. And from about 12 months, they would be finalizing those deliverables, um, working up adoption stories or working, working with adopters to finalize things and to support them. And after they have delivered their final outputs, um, some groups, some working groups turn into maintenance groups, which means they have produced at least one output that they're maintaining and they're willing to provide support to adopters um, on a more ongoing basis. So this is just to orient yourself. If you look at groups, that gives you a bit of an idea of where the group is at. You will see the same color coding if you look at our plenary programs. Um, again, we have that there to inform people about where the groups are at. And I think that's it for me for this part of the presentation. So, so just to finish up, I'll talk a little bit about outputs and recommendations. Um, there are three broad types of RDA outputs, um, recommendations, supporting outputs, and other. Recommendations and supporting outputs um, are a little bit more formal. Other outputs can be pretty much anything, any resource requested by a group to be published on the RDA website, and there is no level of endorsement. Recommendations um, are produced by working groups and undergo a formal endorsement process. They represent the official and endorsed results of RDA. And as I've said before, they need to demonstrate they are adoptable and have been adopted. So it's not enough to say someone could adopt this, they actually have to show they have been adopted. Supporting outputs are produced by RDA working or interest groups. They undergo a community review, which is um, slightly less of a formal review than the um, recommendations. And they're useful solutions, but do not have to show adoption. A little bit more detail. Um, as I said, the RDA recommendations are what we call our flagship outputs. Every working group should develop at least one. Um, that doesn't always work, but very often it does. That can include um, specifications, taxonomies, ontologies, workflows, schemas, data models, etc. So the main point to take here is they're not just a report. They're actually really meant to be things you can take and do things with. They're sort of comparable to other organizations, specifications or standards. Um, each recommendation has an RDA DUI minted. So we mint a DUI with the RDA prefix, which shows that it's been published by the RDA. And after, the, after they get endorsed, they get published with a, an RDA cover page, so RDA branding in the Research Data Alliance collection in Zenodo. There's a link here, um, which you can have a look at if you look at the slides. But also if you go to Zenodo and search for Research Data Alliance, you'll find the collection. Um, supporting outputs, again, um, are useful solutions. Don't have to demonstrate adoption. Um, they also have an RDA DOI minted at the start of the process of endorsement. And after a successful community review, these are also published in the Research Data Alliance collection in Zenodo. Other outputs have no review and are not endorsed by RDA as such, but we have quite a few in what we call the Research Data Alliance related documents collection in Zenodo. These can include, for example, posters that a group may have submitted, presentation slides from a plenary session, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there can be, um, papers that the group or some members of the group have written, all kinds of things. Um, and you may see this slide similar to the group's one. We have an outputs catalog as well, which again lets you search for the current, through the current outputs um, that RDA has. You can search by status, you can search by topic, and you can also search again by domain. Um, and finally, um, we also have, if you're interested in seeing the adoptions of some of our outputs, um, we have a whole list of adoption stories. 
they are documented cases of adoption and they answer or they present question, uh, answers to questions like, so what was the challenge? Why did this organization want to adopt an output? What output or outputs did the organization adopt? How was it done? What were the benefits? Hopefully there were some. And what did you learn? So we have quite a few of those. Um, and there is a link to the list of adoption stories on the slides. And we also have um, a playlist of adoption videos that was created. Um, we had a global adoption week, or oh, it must have been about two years ago, one year ago, um, where we had quite a few adopters talk about their adoptions. And there's a playlist of those stories available. And if you have adopted an RDA output, and we haven't yet got an adoption story about it. We have a form where you can tell us your experience or you can always just contact um, the RDS Secretariat or any of us in person. <laughs>